from the island and over 30,000 tons of steel brought in. Almost overnight, this small village becomes the busiest construction site in Norway. Over 2,200 workers are on the job site each day to keep the huge gas plant rising from the rocky coastline. There's a canteen to feed 1,000 people in a sitting. Each night, the workers retire to the hotel, which will provide one million guest nights over the course of the project. But once the processing plant is up and running, it will be removed. Three-dimensional models of the plant have already been built, and the engineers can virtually walk through it before and during construction. Every bolt and I-beam of steel is pre-visualized. Because of the volatile gas, the specifications have to be executed perfectly. But the plant is also built for efficiency. Raw gas will travel through the pipes and be converted into usable fuel in a mere 10 minutes, then be ready for delivery to the UK. The gas processing units are delivered to the island by ship, then cranes offload the components onto massive flatbed transport. This remote-controlled monster has 48 independent axles and 96 wheels. It expertly shuttles the thousands of components needed to build the plant. Here on land, the workers have a hands-on relationship with the job site. But offshore, workers have downed wrenches in favor of joysticks. The underwater work is done using ROVs, everything from pipeline to heavy lifting. So a lot of different ROVs are required, and a lot of people to operate them. This warehouse contains a simulation tank, built so that offshore personnel can train on ROVs. Here they simulate projects that will take place offshore. It takes special tactile skills to maneuver a crane arm from 1,000 meters away. Multiple cameras allow the operators to see the action. After the intense training with the ROVs, they're sent offshore, where the stakes are high and there are no second chances. This is the Pipeline End Termination Unit, or PLET. It's a big machine with one simple task, to connect the underwater template, or gas well, to the Ormond Lang pipeline. But this is harder than it sounds. The 35 meter long, 30 meter wide, and 350 ton device is lowered 1,000 meters to the sea floor. Once there, engineers assemble its components. Called modules, these components make the crucial connection between the template and the pipeline that feeds gas to Nihana. All the connections at this depth are made with remote operated vehicles. But before any of this work can be done, the systems must be tested. Thomas Bent is the subsea manager. We are testing and testing and testing here, and uh, when we leave this hole, we, we are 100% sure that this connection will be tight when we come offshore. There won't be any leakage. A leakage offshore at 850 meters with large volumes of gas is a disaster, which we have to avoid. They practice lowering the modules and testing the connections, which will handle 70 million cubic meters of gas each day. They train with an exact replica of the one that's on the seafloor. It's a large investment, but it's money well spent. Surrounding the connection module is a steel cage that protects it from any stray objects that could drop off the drill ships and fishing trawlers. When the gas exits the field, the steel pipe expands. A little bit of expansion isn't a problem, but the engineers expect the Ormond Line pipeline to expand along its entire length by as much as one meter, enough to rip it apart. They've solved this problem 
by using a connector that slides back and forth on rails. This will absorb the pipe's movement and keep the gas flowing. Meanwhile, engineers are tackling the Storega slide and trying to get the umbilical cord from the template to the control center 120 kilometers away. To do this, they have to find a way through the rough and tumble terrain left in the wake of the slide. The solution is to build an underwater excavator, agile and strong enough to handle the job. It's a daunting prospect. And the answer is a spider. The machine that inspired this one was originally built for the Swiss forest industry. Like its Swiss cousin, this spider moves on powered tracks using articulated legs. Its mission is to excavate six trenches at depths of up to 1,000 meters. The biggest trench will be four meters wide by four meters deep. One spider is equipped with a powerful shovel, strong enough to cast aside a three-ton boulder. The other spider has a suction nozzle. Powerful water jets break up the sea bottom, then the nozzle sucks it up and fires the mud to the side. All the while, the spiders will have to contend with slopes of up to 35 degrees. There are sensors on all movable parts connected through an umbilical from a support vessel which floats above and monitors progress. The umbilical carries power and control cables and lets operators manipulate the six meter long spider to within 10 centimeters of accuracy from 1,000 meters above. It's an unprecedented mobilization of such complicated and agile robots. In all, these two champion diggers managed to excavate 3,500 cubic meters of soil and create a safe path for the gas pipeline. The Langeled, which will run 1,200 kilometers from Norway to the UK, will be the largest subsea pipeline in the world. Building it requires one-third of the world's combined pipeline production capacity, over one million tons of steel. The value of the pipeline contracts is a staggering $700 million. Langeled uses pipes over one meter in diameter, and each single piece of pipe has to be able to withstand the enormous pressure on the sea floor for the next 40 years. The pipes are each 12 meters long and weigh 10 tons. And another 10 tons of concrete and metal is added to give them enough weight to stay on the ocean floor. A total of 100,000 steel pipes are needed to span the distance between Norway and the UK. That includes over 1 million tons of concrete and 25,000 tons of steel reinforcing. Robert Payne is the man responsible for the integrity of the pipeline as it's being assembled. Uh, each joint of pipe weighs about 20 tons, about 10 tons of steel, 10 tons of concrete. It's concrete and it's got inside of it a wire about mesh foundation to help it stick together. So there's so much volume inside of it whenever it gets on seabed and it gets light of air, it wants to float, so the concrete keeps it situated on seabed. Each of the 100,000 pipes is numbered as it comes out of the plant and is destined for a specific location in the line. As the team trenches on the steep Storega slide, the rest of the route from the top of the slide to shore is being prepared. This is the island frontier, a state-of-the-art trenching ship that combines two trenching methods in one powerful machine. Engineers survey the flat areas where they think they can bury the pipe by scraping a trench through the sandy bottom. But what they discover is not a pretty picture. The sandy bottom is actually clay, and the clay has hardened like concrete. A new digger is required to cut a channel up to seven meters wide and five meters deep. 
The margin for error is only 50 centimeters on the width and a crucial 10 centimeters on the depth. The clay cutter hybrid, the only one in the world, is lowered to the seabed. The cutting tool uses 24 water jets set at different angles to blast a trench through the clay. Suspended above is the four-ton jet prop. The propeller draws in large volumes of the surrounding seawater, driving it at a high force towards the seabed and clearing debris from the trench. Transponders mounted on the sea floor relay a 3D picture of the operations to the control ship. And following along the entire operation is an ROV that surveys the trench and confirms that it's dug to specifications. The battle is finally won. But when they start to lay the pipeline on the seabed, the problems really... The seabed under the North Atlantic is a tortuous, irregular landscape. And there's over 1,000 kilometers of terrain like this along the pipeline route from Norway to England. It's so rugged that only small sections of these heavyweight pipes will actually make contact with the seabed. This is called free spanning. It's something the engineers don't want because it means the unsupported sections of pipe could sag and break under their own weight, causing an environmental catastrophe. They have to find some way of flattening out the route. If you're not able to plane the seabed flat by moving the earth out of the way, you may have to fill in some, some holes with rock or other fill material. They leveled the pipeline route by laying gravel on the sea floor. This ship loads gravel into its cargo holds and delivers it to the area that needs leveling. It can carry over 9,700 tons of gravel at a time. Once at the job site, it uses a flexible fall pipe to place the gravel onto the pipe pathway. Computers create a 3D model of the seabed and the path where the gravel needs to be placed, allowing the crew to place the gravel precisely where they need it. At these sort of water depths, you've got a problem because you, you haven't got that degree of control. I mean, whatever's doing the work down there is, is a huge distance away from the mothership, and they've got to still pre present a flat, smooth profile for the pipeline then to be laid upon. The other thing that has to be worried about is that you have to do that profiling as close as possible to the time that the pipeline is going to be laid because Mother Nature tends to move things around again after you've left. And so you come back in a couple of weeks later and you find there's been a storm or whatever and what you've taken so much care to flatten out has all of a sudden been moved around again. So you would lose the work that you've done before. The pipe laying itself is a monstrous job. Once the pipe has been manufactured, it's placed onto supply ships for delivery to the pipe laying barge, the LB200. The barge is longer than two football fields, an enormous floating steel welding factory which has to work with military precision. There are only three of these ships in the world, and Hydro is using two of them here. The pipeline around has been surveyed before we ever came here. We have an ROV boat that stands by with us. It monitors the pipe as it touches seabed, and it's a predetermined route that we follow. The barge has been used in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Mediterranean, and off the coast of West Africa. But this is its biggest and most historic assignment. Once the pipeline process starts, it can't be stopped, not even for weather or accidents. The pipeline is built as a continuous tube that's dropped from the ship to the seabed. If the ship halts for too long, the strain on the pipe could snap it. The barge moves along at four kilometers a day and needs a constant supply of pipe sections which must be delivered in the order in which they're to be connected and laid down. 100,000 pieces of pipe are laid down end to end in a predetermined pattern. They get moved by crane three or four times and go through about 15 or 20 welding stations and coating stations. Pipe sections are delivered to the assembly floor, deep inside the LB200.
Here, the welders are divided into teams.